Good evening. I'm Sarah Miglio, Assistant Provost here at Wheaton College, and I welcome you to Working Out Our Salvation, Recovering the Protestant Doctrine of Good Works. Our theme this year for the seventh annual Christ at the Core Fall series is the enduring question of how do our spiritual habits and character shape our pursuit of the good life? I'm excited to have Dr. Tom McCall here this evening to discuss how we are called to act out our faith. Significant cultural and religious changes over the past few years increased the urgency and the importance of faithful Christians asking and seeking answers to the question of how does what we do shape our life of faith and who we are becoming. Here at Wheaton, the life of discipleship is something we care about deeply. This is why we've committed to shared beliefs, doctrines that unite us. We've also committed to shared practices, acts of discipleship and faithfulness in our day-to-day -day lives. This is why we have a community covenant alongside our statement of faith. Nearly every Wheaton student reads Dr. Thomas McCall's work before they graduate for their Christian thought class. So it's a real privilege and honor to welcome a distinguished theologian and scholar to campus that we all learn from in one way or another during our time here. I'm looking forward to hearing his lecture. And after his talk, we'll have a brief time of conversation with Dr. McCall, Dr. David Lauber, Dr. Keith Johnson, and Dr. Emily McGowan. But first, Dr. David, David Lauber, our Dean of Biblical and Theological Studies, will introduce our guest. Thanks. It's indeed my honor and pleasure to introduce this, this evening's speaker. Dr. Thomas McCall is the Timothy C. and Julie M. Tennant Chair of Theology at Asbury Theological Seminary. Prior to his appointment at Asbury, Tom served for 16 years as Professor of Biblical and Systematic Theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois, uh, just up the road from here. While he was at Trinity, he was also the director of the Carl F.H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding. Dr. McCall has also held an appointment as a professorial fellow in exegetical and analytic theology at the University of St. Andrews. Dr. McCall is the author of many books and scholarly articles. He has also contributed to several edited scholarly volumes including an excellent chapter on divine providence in an amazing volume on the doctrine of sin, which Dr. Johnson and I happen to have edited. <laughs> he also wrote a book on sin, so there you go. He, he, you can look at our book on the doctrine of sin and then you can take up Dr. McCall's book. Dr. McCall brings both analytic precision and deep faith to his vast scholarship on central Christian convictions and doctrines, in particular, the doctrine of the Trinity, Christology, and theological anthropology. As Dr. Miglio mentioned, many Wheaton students know Dr. McCall's work through his exceptional book, Forsaken, The Trinity and the Cross and Why It Matters. This book has been a required text for the majority of the Christian thought sections since its publication in 2012. In it, Dr. McCall provides remarkable exegetical, theological, and pastoral guidance to the profound and mysterious saving reality of Christ's cry of abandonment from the cross. Dr. McCall is ordained in the Wesleyan Church. He lives out his vocation with intellectual and scholarly rigor, energetic and engaged teaching, and pastoral sensibility and sensitivity. He seeks to instill in his students, as well as in those who read his works and hear him speak, the ability to think clearly and faithfully about the truth of the gospel, so they are better equipped to live as responsible disciples of Jesus as they contribute to the mission of Christ's church in the world. We are delighted to have our colleague and our friend with us tonight and we look forward to being edified by his insights and wisdom. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom McCall.
Thank you, Dr. Lauber, for that introduction. Very, very kind and gracious and unbelievable introduction. <laughs> and thank you for having me here. It is so good to be with you at Wheaton. I have such immense respect and appreciation for Wheaton College and the students here, the faculty here. And it's just a joy, really a joy to be with you tonight. It's an understatement, I think, to say that Christianity has a crisis of credibility. Christians claim to have good news. We talk about the gospel, we talk about the good news, but a lot of people aren't so sure it's good news. To speak plainly, people are hardly interested in the truth claims of Christianity unless and until they see that it matters. They're not even that likely to take the rational defense of the faith seriously until they see it lived out. They're not usually inclined to even give it serious consideration unless there's something about it that makes people hope that it might be true. And they're usually not committed to it unless they're first attracted to something about it. James tells us that religion pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. But frankly, many people just don't see that. They do not see behavior that would suggest that care for others is somehow essential to evangelical Protestant Christian faith. Instead, they see people who are fearful. They see people who are committed to protecting themselves and their heritage. They see people who get pretty fired up about defending their rights. They do not see people who are unspotted from the world. Instead, they see prominent Christian leaders who appear obsessed with status and craven for political power. They hear a message of salvation that's strictly about what happens after we're dead. And, depending maybe on which version of the prosperity gospel one hears, maybe a Christianity that offers health and wealth or better access to the American dream, usually for those who are already ridiculously privileged. Two days ago, I pulled into an airport, and when I came into the parking lot, I saw a big window sticker on the back of a vehicle. The window sticker had on one side of it a large Bible with a cross on the cover. And on the other side, a large Glock-looking handgun. There was some cliche under it, something about salvation and security. But the cliched words hardly matter because the basic message was very clear. I have my ticket to heaven and I'm going there. After I stop, of course, at Starbucks and Chick-fil-A. And if you get in my way, you can go to hell. And if you try to stop me, I'll help you get there. When many people look at evangelical Christianity, they don't see a religion that's pure and undefiled. And in many cases, they simply do not want what they see. For many people, Christianity is irrelevant. For others, they see it as a sinister threat. And, and who am I kidding? I keep talking about they. But I'd be shocked if there weren't a lot of people in this room who don't also wrestle with these concerns. Now, it'd be easy to chalk all this up to hypocrisy or just mere misunderstanding. And I think there's surely truth there. I'm confident that misunderstanding of the truths of Christianity is part of the problem. And yes, there are hypocrites. But I'm also concerned that the problem might run deeper. What if people aren't really misunderstanding what they've been taught? What if they actually get it? What if they're simply living out the faith that they've been taught? Consider these sorts of statements. 
Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. We're saved by faith alone, and good works has nothing to do with it. If you've ever prayed the sinner's prayer, your salvation is eternally guaranteed. Your good works, of course, don't get you saved, and so they can't keep you saved either. To be concerned about good works is actually to reject the good news. It's either your works or Christ's work for you. Which are you going to trust? These sorts of statements abound in popular preaching and teaching. Indeed, in some circles, it seems that good works are not only unnecessary, but are even viewed as being dangerous. After all, if we're saved by faith alone rather than good works, then good works might be the one thing that threatens our salvation. Now, I'm not denying that there are elements of truth in these cliches, but I am concerned that taken alone, they're deeply mistaken. Think about it this way, when earnest Christians are repeatedly told that what they do doesn't matter for their salvation, why should we be surprised when they believe what they hear? Why should we be puzzled when they live accordingly? Why would we be surprised when skeptics, and I'm talking about skeptics from outside the faith and also from inside the faith, why would we be surprised when skeptics think that Christianity doesn't fundamentally change anything that matters in this life? So when people conclude that a life of obedience and good works has nothing to do with the real essentials of Christianity, that is, when people think of the gospel or the good news as fundamentally about escaping the consequences of all the bad things you've done in this life, it may be that people are only believing what they've been told. But what if they haven't been told the truth? The full truth, the beautiful and compelling truth. And what if instead of viewing Christians as special interest groups or political voting blocks, what if instead of seeing people interested in self-defense and self-promotion, what if they understood Christianity to be fundamentally good for the world? What if the first thing people thought of when they thought of Christians was, those are people who, to quote Paul out of Titus 2, are zealous for good works. And what if the good news of Christianity really includes good works within it? What if loving God with all one's heart, mind, and strength, and what the Christian tradition is called works of piety that flow out of that love of God, What if that is really integral to the gospel? What if loving one's neighbor is oneself and the works of mercy and justice that flow out of that love? What if those really were seen as essential to the good news? Well, I'm here to tell you that for historic Protestant theology, good works are part of the good news. So, are good works really important in the Christian life? Well, surely they are, but we could ask this question further. How are they important? Are they necessary for salvation? Not just important, but actually necessary. Not merely necessary for Christian witness, not important just in the sense of showing that one has faith, but truly necessary for faith. Many contemporary evangelical Christians would likely respond with an unhesitating and emphatic no. Many might insist that such a denial was central to the Reformation and indeed is essential to being Protestant. After all, what was this whole Reformation thing about if it wasn't about salvation by grace rather than works? But for much historic Protestant theology, The answers to these questions are a resounding yes. Good works are part of the good news. Good works are necessary for the life of faith. To be a Christian just is to be someone who is transformed so that we can and will do good works. 
Now, there are different views of this, of how this works exactly. There are intramural disagreements and debates. But within mainstream, historic Protestant theology, Lutheran, Catholic, Anglican, this much is certain. First, we do not earn or earn grace or merit salvation by our works. And secondly, good works are nonetheless necessary. As the famous Reformed theologian Francis Turretin asked, are good works necessary for salvation? His answer is unmistakable. We affirm. Many Reformed theologians affirm that good works are necessary as the evidence of salvation. Theodore Beza, for example, says that good works are necessary in this sense, like a healthy tree will produce good fruit. And the good fruit is evidence both of the kind of tree it is and the health of the tree. So also the life of the person who is truly justified and born anew will be productive of the fruit of good works. As Amandus Polanus states the point, these good works are necessary as demonstration of living faith. There is something actually close to unanimity on this point. But some Reformed theologians go further. Some say that good works are a means or medium whereby we receive salvation. Thus Henry Compton says that a virtuous and holy life is necessary to salvation, not as giving a right to salvation, but as the necessary means to attain that right. Johannes Wallabius likewise denies that good works get us any sort of salvation points. You don't earn it. But he does say that good works are the means by which we receive the salvation that God graciously offers. And he gives us this illustration. Consider the person, he says, who lives in Basel, and he re who receives an inheritance from someone in Geneva. The inheritance is completely a gift. There's nothing that the one receiving the inheritance has done to earn it. There is no merit involved. The wealth was secured by another and then freely given to them. Nonetheless, the person in Basel actually has to travel to Geneva to receive it. And the inheritance is not his or hers until they travel to Geneva. So also the repentant and believing sinner must perform good works to actually obtain or receive the salvation merited by Christ and freely offered to desperate sinners. Other Reformed theologians, such as Petrus von Maastricht, go further. Von Maastricht says that explicitly that good works are a condition of salvation. Some go further yet and will say that good works are a cause of salvation. Heinrich Alsted says that good works are a cause sine qua non, without which none. Jerome Zonke, Samuel Rutherford, Gisbert Vutius, they clarify that this is an instrumental cause. Those of you who have taken metaphysics uh, in the philosophy courses here will understand that language. Otherwise, we can save it for Q&A. Johannes Piscator takes a rather different, somewhat more radical line. He goes so far as to say that good works are nothing less than efficient causation. He clarifies this is always and only the kind of causation that we give, that we receive from God. His work is always primary and prevenient. Ours is always secondary and responsive. But his analogy is striking. Someone, he says, who was given a treasure buried on a mountain must not only climb the mountain, but also dig the treasure from the summit. The treasure is a gift. It's not owed or earned, but yet it must be obtained. And good works directed toward God and neighbor are like the effort to climb the mountain and dig it out. Similarly, the Anglican theologian John Davenant denies that good works earn a salvation. They're not meritorious. They don't partly earn salvation. They certainly don't fully earn it. But he also says that good works are necessary to receive the gift of salvation that's offered. He appeals to various illustrations to illumine his point. Those who are sick 
must, uh, must approach the physician and receive the proper medication. Those who are destitute must approach the almsgiver and stretch out their hands. And so also one must perform good works toward God and neighbor. He warns that it is impossible to reach the goal of salvation when the pursuit of good works is evaded or rejected. What happens, he, can, he asks, if a believer should wander from the path of good works and onto a bypath? His answer is as bracing as it is clear. I say, he says, that whilst traveling this path, he is proceeding straight to hell. True story, I'll date myself. I came across that passage and I thought, who knew? ACDC just plagiarized a 17th century theologian um, with Highway to Hell. Turretin's summary offers a good overview of this classical Protestant teaching. He says that good works would be understood in three ways. With respect to the legal side of our salvation or justification, with respect to sanctification, that is the work that God is doing to transform us, and with respect to glorification or the end, the end result. And he says good works are related to justification not antecedently or efficiently or meritoriously, but consequently. They show that we are truly justified. They're related to sanctification constitutively because they actually are the means by which God transforms us. And they're related to justification, or sorry, glorification antecedently because this is the way that God changes us finally. He concludes that good works, as he says, are necessary above all things. I could go on. I've got lots of receipts. I won't go further with these. But even from this brief summary, we're in a position to see that the doctrine of good works is an important and intrinsic feature of historic Protestant theology. This is not a Roman Catholic thing. The Reformed theologians, as well as the Lutherans and Anglicans and others, steadfastly deny that good works earn our salvation. We don't do good stuff to impress God and thereby hope that he might offer us some grace. No, they say, to the contrary, we always and only act in response to God's grace. But this grace that comes freely from God not only enables us to respond, but also demands the response. And a response to grace includes good works of piety, that is love of God, and good works of mercy and justice, that is love of neighbor. By our good works, they insist, we bring glory to God. We testify to God's goodness and saving power. We assist and edify our neighbors. And yes, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, virtually everyone thinks good works are necessary as evidence. As Martin Luther says, if good works do not follow, then faith is false and not true. Again, many others add that good works are necessary as the means of rejecting salvation. Others say it's the condition. Others go further yet and say it's a cause. But I hope that the main point is clear. Confessional and scholastic Protestant theologians understood scripture to teach that good works are important, integral, essential, necessary. They understood this biblical teaching to be clear and forceful. And they warned that we ignore this teaching only at great peril. In our day, there are prominent strands of evangelical theology that deny that good works have anything to do with salvation. Some theologians even warn that if you're concerned about good works, you're already in danger because you're departing from the gospel. There are other strands of evangelical theology that don't go quite this far, but that nonetheless downplay or simply ignore the importance and necessity of good works. Many of these evangelical Protestant theologians claim to be the true heirs of the Reformation and the defenders of historic Protestant Christianity. But if the major theologians of historic Protestant Christianity were here today, they might want to know why. They might say, keep our name out of your mouth. 
Now, it's possible to hear all I've just rehearsed and, and think, oh, great. I thought I didn't have to do anything but say a prayer. And now these old dudes are telling me I have to do a lot more. Now what? How much more? And how do I know I've ever done it? We might think, and sometimes we do, we think of salvation as if it's nothing more than a legal contract. If you keep your end of the deal, then God will act graciously toward you. The easy contract says, your part of the deal is just to say the right prayer. And if you do that, then God will guarantee that you don't suffer any negative consequences of all the bad stuff you're doing. The harder contract is, you got to do a bunch of good deeds. But if you do enough of them, then God might shield you from the negative consequences of all the bad stuff you're doing. I think it's really natural to think this way. It's common. It's just really easy to slip into thinking about God and about relationship with God as if it's a kind of legal contract. But please hear me, it's also mistaken. To think this way is to miss the point. So let me try to briefly put this into theological perspective. And let's start at the beginning, like the very beginning with God. In fact, let's go all the way to the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of the Trinity is a deep and profound mystery at the very heart of the Christian faith. It tells us that the God of the Christian faith is the triune God. It tells us that God's own life is the life of perfect holy love given and received between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's life is a life of perfect and holy action. The older theological traditions would often refer to this by saying that God's life is pure act. Modern theologians sometimes say that God's act is in his being and his being is in an act. God is, both ways, the highest good, the greatest good, goodness itself. God loves the world, but not by accident. No, God loves the world because, as John tells us, God is love. God gives because God loves. And God loves because God's own life is the life of giving love. God creates from this love. Not as a cosmic experiment. Not as a way of seeking something better for himself. Not for any other reason than to share his own goodness. He doesn't create to get something. He creates to give. And even when his creatures turn against him in rebellion and sin, he gives again and again and again. He gives himself and binds himself to these creatures by making a covenant, which is not reducible to a legal contract. And then he fulfills that promise, that covenant, himself by becoming human. He gives, and he gives, and he gives, and he gives. And how do we receive the grace that he gives? By giving. We receive this grace by extending and offering this grace. We receive this grace by giving of ourselves in good works of piety, by loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, by worship and adoration and submission and allegiance to the triune God. And we receive this grace by giving in good works of justice and mercy, by loving our neighbors as ourselves, by feeding the hungry, by welcoming the sojourner, by visiting the imprisoned, by comforting those who grieve, by defending those who are oppressed. 
This is not something that can be reduced to a legal contract. To view God and our relationship with God that way is to profoundly miss the point. Instead, a life with God is life in covenant with God. The God whose own inner life is a life of love given and received between Father, Son, and Spirit. The God who not only shared that love internally, but the God who has extended that holy love to us. We don't do good deeds in an effort to earn something or somehow obligate God. No, we do good deeds as a way of returning God's love and giving it to others. We receive it by giving. In conclusion, let me try to connect this to real life, at least a little bit more concretely. And I just want to be plain with you, straightforward. I want to be realistic. To belong to God, to give ourselves wholly to the God who gives himself to us, is to be wholly his. To know Christ as Savior is to know him as sovereign and Lord. To be saved is not reducible to a legal contract. It's to be joined in union with Christ. And to be joined in union with Christ is to share not only his benefits, but also his sufferings. It's as Paul says in Galatians 2, to be crucified with Christ. It's to be joined with him in the fellowship of his sufferings. It's to come to share Christ's afflictions and to come to share Christ's affections. That is, to abhor what he abhors and to love what he loves and even somehow to come to love who he loves. No matter how unlovable they seem, whether that be ourselves or others. So make no mistake, when Jesus calls him to himself, he is calling us to union with himself and a life of radical discipleship. And when he unites us to himself, he, re, he unites us to the one who is rejected and crucified. If anyone wants to come after me, he says, that person must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to lose his life, save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. To be joined in union with Christ, to return God's love by allegiance to him, is to renounce all competing ideologies. To love God supremely and love one's neighbors oneself. That is to share and extend Christ's love not only to those like us, but to those unlike us. Not only to those who like us, but to those who hate us and fear us. To do this is to live in open and pronounced defiance of all political claims on us. To put God first is to be on a collision course with common political allegiances and alliances. And the most basic work of piety, that is confessing Jesus as Lord, is a profound political statement. We belong to God and cannot be bought or bribed. That will come with a cost. It cost God himself in the person of the Son. And it will cost those of us who live with him. But if we must be realistic about the life of good works, we have so much reason to be hopeful. Indeed, we should be filled with joy. Think about it. The same God who has worked so graciously for us now promises to continue his good work in us even as he calls us to join in his work in the world. The same God who draws us into communion with himself empowers his people to work with him. We dare not ignore the importance and necessity of good works. But God hasn't called us to frenetic activity as if we're commanded to do our best to try to impress God with how good we are, or how holy we are, or just how busy we are. 
No, God has called us and summoned us and invited us to live and work with God. That means that we, finite and feeble, broken and pathetic creatures that we sometimes are, are invited and called to join God's work in the world. We're not told to do something impossible and then thrown back upon ourselves to somehow find the strength and resources to do it. We're not told to earn something that God would really rather withhold from us. No, the God who calls us into his own life and into his own labor is the same God who promises to fill us with his Holy Spirit. God's salvation and the good works that are part of it are all of grace. This is the good life. As I've said, there, there is a cost to discipleship. But the real cost, the unbearably high cost, is borne by those who turn away from God's call. A life of wholehearted love of God and like-minded love of neighbor is the life of abundance promised in Scripture. This is the good life. The life that promotes human flourishing. The life that seeks the welfare of the city. The life that gives itself away. And I know, I know, sometimes it seems like our best efforts are futile. Sometimes we're just humbled. We recognize our own laziness. We see our own complicity in just settling for what's comfortable. Sometimes we bounce around, right? We vacillate between periods of energized activism where we're going to change the world and other times of apathy. Sometimes we look in the mirror and we just see sloth. And sometimes when we're really motivated and fired up, we're guilty of the old, I'm holier than thou and busier than thou in mentality. But we should not be discouraged by our own ineffectiveness or our shortcomings or any remaining sinfulness in our best efforts. Instead, we should, as the book of Hebrews exhorts us, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We should rest secure in the knowledge that to be joined in union with Christ is to be saved, and to be saved is to be safe. We should, again, as the book of Hebrews tells us, keep on loving strangers, keep on welcoming the stranger. And as we do so, we rejoice in the Hebrews affirmation of God saying, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Sometimes we do our best and it's embarrassing and pathetic mess. We vacillate between um, arrogant, the arrogant kind of activism that thinks we can change the world and fix everything and apathy and cynicism that says don't even try. But to be joined in union with Christ is something different. It's to come to share his passion for our world. To receive God's grace is to give God's grace, even when we do it imperfectly. This real-life tension was brought home to me with great force a few months ago. I was leaving the annual conferences of the American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature held in San Antonio last year. I had been involved personally in two sessions. One in a pretty technical discussion of the inseparable operations of the Trinity and the other one focused on a book I had done, Analytic Christology and the Theological Interpretation of the New Testament. Just before leaving before the airport, my bags were packed, I came, went to one last session, and it was an absolute powerhouse session on the reception of medieval Christology in the early Reformation. My mind was spinning with reflections, all these debates, all these rich conversations. And then I saw them. I first noticed them sitting near my gate as I was waiting for my flight from San Antonio to Chicago. 
The little dude was maybe 16 or 18 months old. He had big dark eyes. Sweatshirt and jeans. And those tiny little sneakers like my boys used to wear. Little dude's mom was wearing gray sweatpants and a tan sweatshirt. And she was holding a large shopping bag and clutching that little boy so tightly to her. He was obviously tired. She looked completely exhausted. When I saw them, I wondered what their story was. Maybe, I thought, from somewhere in Central America. When we started to board the plane, I couldn't help but notice that she didn't speak or understand any English whatsoever. And I also couldn't help but notice that the flight attendant was not willing or able to give much help. So I offered my assistance. And I carried the large shopping bag and helped them get settled in their seats. And then I took mine. And throughout that flight, I just kept thinking about them. Who were they? Where were they from? What is their story? What do they need? And when we landed, I waited till everyone else came off the plane, and then I walked to the back of the plane, and I again offered to help. Little dude's big, dark eyes were full of wonder. He just stared at me, curious, unblinking. Above her mask, his mama's eyes were full of something else, some combination of suspicion and exhaustion and fear and what looked like sheer desperation. She understood I was trying to help, and so after some time, she just handed me their tickets, trusting that I would help them find their place. Walking through the airport, I offered to buy them food, but instead she declined and, and began to ask for a banyo. When we found one, I offered to hold the boy while she went in, but she pointed to his backside and told me he was the one who needed it. Above her mask, it seemed for a fleeting second that her eyes almost smiled. When they came out of the restroom, I helped them find their gate, and I told the gate agent that these people would need further help. I didn't have much with me, but I gave them what cash I had. And when I handed it to her, she immediately reached down to her lower leg and pulled up her pant leg to show me the electronic monitor strapped tightly around her ankle. And then suddenly she had so much to say. But it was coming with such force and passion and speed, I just couldn't keep up. I tried to tell her I didn't care what was on her leg. And above her mask, her eyes softened and welled with tears as she repeated the word gracias. And they went onto their plane. And I went onto my gate. And that was that. Except that it wasn't. For I couldn't stop thinking about them. For just a few minutes, I was almost able to see the world through their frightened eyes. What was their story? Were they undocumented immigrants who had fled home in desperation but then had been arrested? Was she someone with a criminal conviction? In retrospect, I began to worry that I'd missed something truly awful. Did I see someone being trafficked and didn't even catch it? Did my efforts to help, which were sincere but ignorant and clumsy, did somehow that make her situation worse? I don't know. But I do know this. I know that God is the God of the alien.
God is the God of the sojourner, the desperate, and the humble. I know that God is the God of goodness, of holy love that's expressed as justice and mercy. And I know that God did not just declare himself to be such a God, but that God entered a world of injustice and hatred and strife and sin to bring reconciliation and holiness and love. I know that God became a dark-eyed baby boy in the arms of a desperate refugee mother. I know that he did so to bring redemption and hope to this world now and to bring wretched and desperate sinners home, home to the life of the triune God whose very essence is holy love. I know that God sanctifies his people so that we can be what Peter says are partakers of the divine nature. And I know that God makes us so that we will be zealous for good works. I know that this is good news. And I know that this good news is not antithetical to good works. To the contrary, Good works are part of that good news. We receive God's grace by giving it. God works on us and for us and in us so that work God can work through us. God justifies us freely by grace through faith alone. And good works follow this as the evidence of God's work. God renews and transforms and sanctifies his people. And God uses good works to do that. And somehow, astoundingly, God transforms broken and self-centered and perverted sinners into agents of his own work in the world. And so, brothers and sisters, let me encourage you in the words of St. Paul, Continue to work out your salvation. For it is God who works in you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that God does good works for us. And thanks be to God that God enables us, allows us, calls us, invites us, commissions us to extend God's great work in our world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. The uh, those words were words that I certainly needed to hear, and I'm, I'm sure those uh, gathered in front of us needed to hear those as well. Um, as you were talking, I had all kinds of questions, and um, I'm not going to ask those right now. I'm going to ask my colleagues, uh, Dr. McGowan and Dr. Uh, Johnson, simply to reflect on what they heard and uh, draw out things from Dr. McCall's reflections, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. I'll just say it was good to hear Christianity presented. Mm -hmm. And that's what you did. Um, the good news and its entailments, its effects. That is the Christian faith. Um, what was interesting to me is you... Um, I'm thinking in a room full of students, many of whom are studying theology in, in various classes here through their time at Wheaton, um, what, what difference does all that academic work make? Um, here's what you did tonight. You took a problem that we're all seeing, um, a Christianity in America that doesn't seem to be working because something has been short-circuited where the pieces don't come together for people. And the teaching is heard, but it's not, it's half true at best. And you went back to the tr tradition, read it carefully, 
and through that reading of the tradition with scripture in front of you, um, saw the great leaders of the church teaching us, this is how you read it, and then applied that to the situation to change our categories. So instead of having, well, I can't have works because I have to have faith alone, as if those are contrasts, resetting those contrasts, using theology to say, it's not really a polarization like that, it's grace through giving, which is a way of using the tradition to help us think again and think in new ways about this um, place we've got stuck. And that's what learning can do. You can go back to the tradition and see places you get stuck and say, what's going on? Maybe I'm not asking the right question. Um, and it was just a, a, a brilliant way of doing that to preach Christianity again. So in the midst of a world where we're, we're not quite getting it, to have it presented again. And that is um, deeply encouraged. Um, <clears throat> when you were sharing, I actually wrote down a, something that, um, it reminded me of something Dallas Willard said once that I heard him say, that grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. And that's something I've repeated to students when we get into questions about sanctification. Um, and so I often use that as a jumping off point to say that good works are the way by which we place ourselves in the position of receiving grace from God. And that's actually the pattern of life we see in Jesus. Uh, it's not that we pray or worship or read the scriptures or give alms or fast because we're earning a place before God. We have a place before God and we do these things to then receive more of his grace. So what that, what that results then in sanctification, at least as I understand it, is that rather than thinking that we are justified by faith and then we're sanctified by our works, which we don't want to make the mistake of thinking, but we are actually justified by grace through faith as we're being sanctified, I'm sorry, we're sanctified by grace through faith as well, right? So that we're receiving grace from God and that's what sanctifies us. It's always by his grace, by his spirit. Um, our, our job then is to place ourselves in the position to receive that light and life and power from God. Is that a fair like restating? Uh, yeah, I think that's helpful. Uh, if, if I was too long-winded, just go with what she just said. Oh. <laughs> and, and what, um, actually you're laughing, so I think since I was too long-winded, uh, <laughs> you go, go, with what, go with what she was saying. Um, I love Dallas Willard. Um, I met him several years ago, not long before he passed away, and shortly after my own father had passed. And I was just astounded by their looks, their mannerisms, their... I, I mean, I thought I was talking to my dad for a little bit again, but he had this wonderful way of, of summarizing. See, it took me 40 minutes. It took, you know, it just takes a few seconds if you do it right. So keep doing theology so you could do it better. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, the, all right. So one, one problem with like thinking about good works is just we don't think about it, right? Just it's a bad thing it's gone. Another bad way, as I try to say, is when we get into sort of the consumer mentality or legal mentality, whereby we're doing something to, that then obligates God to do something that God probably doesn't want to do anyway. And that's just such a wrong-headed way of looking at this. Everything we get is by grace. We receive from the God who gives. But what I'm trying to say is that the way we receive it is not to hoard it, or whatever that would mean anyway. The way we receive it is to extend and share it. We receive by giving. All right, thank you. I mean, and there's a relational quality to that kind of logic. So if you think of, you know, a marriage, you don't hoard your love or even the, it doesn't even make sense. Like, to the love grows and the relationship you get so much more when you give the love. It's, there's a, not a competitiveness or an either or to that relationship. There's a more and more as you relate. And um, this way of framing it gives you that more and more. As you are serving God, living like Christ, doing these works in a particular direction, which look like caring for the oppressed, caring for the poor, doing justice, God's grace is being manifested and received in your life. So, so one, uh, thank you. Um, 
the, I think it's just, I just want to echo to that and, and point out that when we appeal to care, categories like marriage, we're not just making things up. This is a deeply biblical theme that really runs, I mean, you could see it sort of from Genesis really to Revelation. Um, this is a consistent and very powerful way that scripture describes our relationship with God. Uh, negatively, um, the pictures in the prophets are pretty, pretty horrific. Uh, it's of unfaithfulness and things get worse from there. Um, but positively, it's that God takes those who even were unfaithful and turns us into, into those who are faithful. Again, it's by grace, but the, 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 the analogy itself is, is, is all throughout Scripture, both Testaments, um, arguably even from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. So we're not, we're not just making that up because it's convenient. It's part of the picture. The, the legal category is part of Scripture, but it's not the only one. We also have different familial categories, and, and those include these of the nuptial or marriage relationships. Think of, well, I have the marriage certificate. Yeah. I'm good. Uh, your marriage is not going to go very well. Yeah. Um, yes, you do need to be married. That legal part is really important, but there's that relational um, mutuality that is ever deepening, ever growing, precisely through the opening up front of one to the other. And, and with that, it's when we share this love. So it, historically, I, I didn't go into this. By the way, I, I should have mentioned, although it's kind of immodest too, uh, a couple of friends and I, uh, Matt and Caleb Friedman and I, have a book forthcoming on, on good works. And in there, we, we lay some of this stuff out. But when I we talk about traditionally in two major categories, I mentioned them several times, I didn't really explain. Uh, good works of piety, and that roughly corresponds to what Jesus says when he was asked, what's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Also corresponds, by the way, to the first table of the law if you look at the Ten Commandments. Those are important. But right with that, so again, think when Jesus is asked, um, what's the first and greatest commandment? He gets one question. He doesn't get two. He gets one. It's what's the, what's the big one? Notice how he answers, though. He will not separate the most important from the one that's just like it. He's not asked, can you rank the top two? He's asked, what's the top one? We might be comfortable separating those. Jesus won't let us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And so these are what are called historically works of, works of mercy. It's works of piety toward God, works of mercy toward others. And when love is extended, um, to continue our analogy, Keith, when love is extended, I, this is, sounds so silly to say this now. I'm actually kind of embarrassed, but I'll just say it anyway since I've gone this far. We're among friends here. It's okay. Yeah. No, no, all I right. So, so I remember before we had our first kid. It just sounds so stupid, but it's true. I was actually worried. Is this child going to somehow come between us? Right? Is this going to divide our love? It took like half hour in the hospital with a new baby to realize how ridiculous that is. It didn't divide our love. It just deepened it. And so when we share love, uh, right, we receive, we receive by giving. And that's giving back to God, but also giving to, the, uh, to our neighbors. And when we do, it doesn't divide it. It deepens it. Okay, I'm going to do a little moderating work and ask another question. Um, it seems to me that a lot of what you were talking about could be related to questions about obedience in the Christian life and perhaps even freedom, especially in, in a culture, society that we live in that prizes freedom, a certain kind of freedom, um, and may be a little suspicious of, of obedience. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of true Christian understandings of freedom and obedience and how it relates to yeah. um, what you were talking about. Well, there's three about. of us to answer this, yeah. right? So good, yeah. Yes, yeah. but we yeah. will start with you. Okay. Um, I just think biblically, with respect to, to thinking about freedom, we're most free 
when we're joined in union with Christ, uh, again, back to the analogies we're using, I'm freest in relationship with my wife when I'm committed to her. It, it's not that it, um, I mean, it's not that it somehow, re, you know, is a, it's, it's just what I want, okay? And, and, I, and I feel freest in that secure relationship. And so, again, to be joined in union with Christ, yes, it is to be obedient. But it's the obedience of faith. It's the obedience of freedom. It's the obedience of love. Um, it's not a servile fear-based uh, approach. It makes me think about the, you know, you guys are reading Augustine, or you will read Augustine's Confessions, um, that he says that we were made for God. Yep. And if that's who we're made for, then we are actually most free as we live in relation to that God. We, you are actually the least free when you're not living according to what you were made for. I mean, you've had the experience of like grabbing the wrong utensil in the kitchen, right? And you try to do something with that utensil that is not supposed to happen. Uh, my daughter's learning how to bake, and so she tried the other day to, to make um, a very thick like bread dough and mix it with a fork. Did not work very well. <laughs> and that was not freedom, right? She's using something for a purpose that it's, that, that it's not for. And so when we as human beings aren't living in union with God, uh, devoting our, our bodies, mind, soul, strength to God, we're actually not free. And so obedience is the path to freedom. Um, but it's very difficult for us to get our minds around that. Um, and I'll just say one more thing about that. I think that's also, it's very important then what you think about God. So I loved how you rooted this in a proper doctrine of God. God is triune love and goodness. Because if you're convinced that that God who is telling you who you are is not good and not trustworthy, well, then you're not going to give your life to him. You're not going to entrust your life to him. Um, so, I don't know much to add to that, other than I was thinking of Galatians 5, where Paul says, for freedom Christ set you free. And if you keep reading, he says, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but out of love become slaves to one another. And that, that's servants. So you've been set free to become a servant out of love just like Christ did, who didn't consider his status as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, a servant. So living life in Christ is living in that same self-giving pattern that he did. And what Jesus is, you know, when Jesus said, I come, I come that you might have life and have it to the full, he should think, this is the way of life. This is what it looks like to truly be human. And we like to think of freedom as, I get to choose what I want. But what Jesus is telling us and what scripture again and again tells us is that freedom is living the way you were made to be. And that looks like the way God is. And God is love. And he gives himself in love so that we may give ourselves in love to others. There's the path to freedom. It runs through that. And it comes down to do we trust that Jesus' call, that I've come, that you have life, and it looks like this, is really true. And that's... That's the question of faith. Do you believe in Jesus? It's not about praying a prayer about a, that he died for you. That's true. But it's about allegiance and commitment, saying, I believe in him. He's my Lord. And when my Lord tells me this is how it is, this is how I live. This is the way. This is the path of freedom. This is the path of life to the full. Some of the, the freest people I've known have... have been such a surprise. Um, I was traveling, I think it was eight years ago this this week, I think. Uh, I was traveling, doing some le some lectures in New Zealand. And um, I happened to be at the same place as someone I, um, and I heard her, I heard her speak. And I, so I immediately I want to talk to her. And the, the life story she shared with me is just astounding. Um, she and her, husband who was a physician were living in um, a war-torn country in the Middle East I think that's all I'll say right now um, they were living there and she had the stories these stories about how things got worse and worse and worse and worse 
until finally um, he was stopped. He was on his way to a remote village in this, in this war-torn country um, to bring medical help. And he was stopped and accused of, of, of certain things and, and, and killed by, by a well-known terrorist group. And I'm talking to her, and she's late 60s. And she said, please be careful if you ever talk about this because I want to be able to go back. And she said, I'm planning to move back next month. She wanted to spend the rest of her life reaching to the people who had killed her husband. She had such peace and joy, such freedom. It's just astounding to me. And it's it's. It's part of this paradox of the more we try to hang on to something, the, the, less, we, the less we have of it. The more we give, the more we, we, we've received. And we forget it. Yeah. Like, we forget, like, we're like professionals at this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're, the three of us at least, are like, also are, like, officially bad. ordained by, like, a pre, yeah. by, like, a church body. And every week I forget it which is why I need to hear the gospel every week proclaimed to me. I need to repent every week because I know this is true, but for some reason my body forgets. Um, my heart forgets. Yeah. We have time, I think, for one more question for our panelists. And uh, Tom, at the, near the end of your, your remarks, you mentioned a couple times um, sort of the, the temptation on the one hand towards arrogant activism and triumphalism, on the other hand, the temptation of apathetic cynicism. And I'm wondering if you and then uh, my colleagues could leave us with some <laughs> advice for how do we avoid those things? How do we avoid arrogant triumphalism on the one hand and apathetic cynicism on the other? I wish I had a great answer. I don't, so I'll probably talk too long in response. <laughs> but um, because I, I struggle with this too, right? Um, and I think I think you know we either get it's one you know we bounce back between one or the other. And I think again, I, I I pointed us to Hebrews for a reason, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who's the author, the one who begins it, and the perfecter, or the one who who brings it to completion. I think that helps immensely, and one way that happens, I think, is when we live and work together in relationships of community and accountability. Sometimes I think I'm doing great, and someone loves me enough to say, stop, you're, you're making things worse. Or where I just think there's no point, and someone loves me enough to say, we can't stop caring about her. We can't stop loving her. That, that sort of thing, yeah. I'll, I'll go so we can get Dr. McGowan last word, um, which is always a wise thing to do, trust me. Um, Tom stole my answer. Jesus is, I mean, how do you balance between this kind of cynicism, like no one really believes this stuff, or arrogance, I've got this all figured out. Um, on the one hand, you look at, Jesus and you realize man I am in need of a savior I am a sinner through and through I'll never I do not measure up to the kind of life he's called me to be um and then when you look at well then maybe this is not worth it maybe does this really work and then but Jesus <laughs> I can't let go of Jesus um he keeps saying follow me um I mean sometimes the church looks you look at the church and it's fallen apart, parts of it. Um, or you look at the world and you're like, man, this is complicated. I don't know how to do this anymore. Th things that used to work don't work anymore. What does it look like to be faithful now? I don't know. And yet there is still Jesus. Um, so some days that's all I have. Um, and he will humble you and lift you up. Um, and that... I think keeping your eyes fixed there and reminding yourself, I don't know if I can be a Christian anymore, but I can't let go of Jesus because he is not letting go of me. I mean, that is where you can go back to again and again. At least I do. Yeah, I, I think the, the word that I was thinking of was abiding. That's Jesus' language in John 15. Um, and I know it's, it sounds like the, the trite thing to say, 
um, you have to abide in Christ. But that is actually the answer. <laughs> um, and that's, that's what this whole life is about, um, is learning to abide in Jesus. And, and that means we, we can't abandon the kinds of rather boring, mundane practices that the church has handed down to us for 2,000 years, uh, like being quiet before God, like reading the scriptures, like um, praying with the community, worshiping, receiving the sacraments. Um, like those are the means by which we receive grace. And that's then the means by which God speaks to us, empowers us, corrects us, um, strengthens us. We just can't do without those things. I, I've tried. <laughs> You know, because you do, you get discouraged, um, and you think there's got to be a faster, better way to do this. You know, we're like developed modern Americans here, but there's just not. There's no replacement for those kinds of things. Um, that's how the Spirit is pleased to work with us, um, and we have to somehow believe that that's actually good news. So yeah. I, um, I grew up out west and lived in Alaska for a while, and I, I love love mountains and outdoors and all this stuff. A few years ago, um, we were out, out uh, right on the Idaho-Montana border on vacation, and we decided to do a family hike. We've done backpacking trips with them since they could really barely walk. Well, so we decided to do St. Mary's Peak, and there's a long trail up St. Mary's Peak, but it's safe, so that's why we picked that one. And the older kids were, they were like seven and eight, I think, were the two oldest and then my youngest was with me, and he was two. And all of our kids, they'd done pretty well, and he's really strong. And so I was like, I expect him to walk maybe half the way, and then, you know, I'll help him. So I had a, a pack to put him in and stuff. We go like 100 yards down the trail. I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. Like 100 yards down the trail. He's like, oh, my legs hurt. <laughs> so carry me. So I put him in the pack. We go like a quarter of a mile. He's like, this pack hurts my legs. Can I, can I walk? So I take him out. If we do this the whole way up this dang mountain. It's on the pack, on my shoulders because I like to pack. Then it's walking for 100, 100 yards. By the time we were probably halfway, I was just so, like, all the fun had gone out of this trip. I was just, I was just being stubborn. Like, we're going to the top because we're going. It was just miserable. Finally, we get all the way to the summit. We're above tree line, way up at the top, you know. And he's on my shoulders, and I'm, I'm so tired, and I'm so frustrated. And finally, I get all the way up there. He's sitting on my shoulders. We get all the way to the very top, like the peak. We're standing on the peak, and then there's this one uh, cairn of rocks that goes up about another two feet. And he goes, let me down, let me down. So I let him down. He runs up that cairn of, of stones. He flexes on me. <laughs> and he says, I did it. I was like, no, you didn't do anything, right? But that is somehow, sometimes, kind of like our Christian life of good works. We can't do anything, or we're bragging about how great we are. And in neither case was he doing this on his own. I think of that, and I think of the words of Jesus John 16, when he says, I'm going to go away, but it's actually better for you that I'm going. And all the disciples are like, what the, like, what the what, Jesus? Like, this ain't, no. And he says, it is. He says, it's better that I go away because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. So the good news is for us, we're not, God doesn't, Again, God doesn't tell us to go do a bunch of stuff to impress him. God works through us in the world. But it's God working through us. That's why we read, work out your salvation. Because God is at work in you. And that's good news. Amen to that. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been delightful. We'll, we'll have to do it again sometime. Uh, please join me in thanking our guests, Dr. Tom McCall, and our colleagues, Dr. McGowan and Dr. Johnson. <laughs>